so um, kind of order the Bob Hill Roxbury um, Board of School Commissioners uh, meeting for April 6th. Um, thank you everyone for coming. It's awesome to see this type of turnout. Uh, I've been on the board six years. And I've seen this type of turnout maybe three or four times. Um, I want to ask how many people want to speak, and it looks like we might need a speaker's list and um, and why don't and a little time limit. So if people who want to speak, would it be possible to Andrew's just working on it right now. Yeah. Yes. Um, take names. Perfect. Um, Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> so just come up and write your name down. Yeah. Well, we're there. Jim. This is sort of my usual spiel about like when people that are coming to our meetings that don't usually come, maybe give like a quick explanation of how public comment yeah, time works, and um, and like if they don't sign up and then they're moved to speak like after a few people speak like they can still right yeah. it'll still be open for them sure. yeah yeah but just um i know sometimes it's hard to like actually get up there and write your name on the thing and be brave mm -hmm. Could people who are on the phone who want to speak on uh, raise your hand with the raise hand function if you can. Where's that? Because that line has to come up. So, Leslie. Yep. All right, so is it just um, just okay. Leslie who wants to? Speak? Oh no, Tim Favorite has his, his hand up. Tim Favorite. <clears throat> and if you're on Zoom and you don't know how to raise your hand, sorry. You yeah, can... you can do it physically. So I've got 10 people who would like to speak. Um, just so you know the procedure around public comment. Um, we listen during public comment. Uh, we don't respond or engage in discussion. That doesn't mean we're not listening. And obviously we're considering this later tonight. So it, it's gonna go directly to that conversation that we have later. Um, if after everyone speaks uh, during the public comment period, you would like to speak further, you can. Um, uh, just let, looks like, you can either let me know or you can let um, Grant or Andrew LaRosa know and they can tell me and, and Grant and Andrew just raise your hand and so people know who you are. Um, and, after, and after everybody's done, I will just give a call out to see if anybody else wants to talk. Um, given the number, I would I would ask people to try to keep themselves to about thirty seconds, um, and I am going to do my best with the names. I might get a couple wrong because I I can't fully read a couple things that people wrote down. <laughs> Sharon. Yeah, so that we don't have a track coach who's asked to. Oh, okay. 
Sorry, Cody. Um, yeah, and, and you can take a little extra time, definitely. Um, try not to take a ton of extra time. But, uh, awesome. Um, so I'm gonna, Ezra, Merrill Triplett, and Meg presenting. That is totally Teamwork. fine. So <laughs> you guys, you can you guys can have a minute. Then. Uh, I'm Meg Vojan. I'm Ezra Merrill Triplett. Uh, we were part of the track enrichment group last year. We recognize all of you. We've done <laughs> a lot of talking up here. Um, we just wanted to come up and continue to show our support and say that track is a super accessible sport um, because it has such a great range of events from the 100 meter, which is lasting like 15 seconds to the 3K, which is closer to 15 minutes. Um, a lot of kids can find their stride, no pun intended, um, <laughs> in the sport, especially because we have running and jumping and throwing and all these different uh, ways that people can use uh, their bodies to, it just is really like, diverse and so they're they can specialize yeah, it's a big range if you're not great at like catching and throwing you know there's javelin and shot put and all sorts of stuff for track um and yeah we've been doing track since like sixth or seventh grade uh we don't like go to u32's track on occasion for practices just because it's better than going to this one um and we want a new track yeah thank you all thank you appreciate Excellent. you thank you <clears throat> Um, and Otis Loga. So I'm Otis. I have two houses here, one in Montpelier, and I go to UW2. And next year, next fall, I'll be captain of the six six time defending state champion and 2021 New England champion cross country. Um, I started running track in eighth grade and then ninth grade they got me to they convinced me to run cross country. I didn't know that I was capable of running on uneven surfaces because of my disability. But now I run cross country track, sit ski with the Nordic Paralympic team. And I want, I am in support of redoing the track. And I want to give everybody the benefit and support, support all people and have the same opportunities I did on running on a fresh track and starting their running career. And a new track will support not only the running community, but also um, people can walk on the, or just chill on the new track. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Charles? Maybe. Oh, is that um, Charlie Phillip? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Charlie. I had to pull my second grade teacher <laughs> eyes out on that one. <laughs> we'll see you after school. Yeah. I'm going to speak just briefly tonight about, uh, our, as a former track coach here at Montpelier High School, I had a two-hour reminiscing presentation ready for you, but I decided <laughs> I'd forego that. But I want to share one story that reflects on the track that's out there now. One of my fondest memories was the philosophical battle that the track coaches had with Carolyn Silsby, who was in the um, science department. The snapping turtles would come up and lay eggs on the, on the track, and we would go out for practice and we'd be cordoned off with Carolyn's sign saying, don't trespass. That's some of the history of, of the track. But uh, there, there are two things I think that I just want to be sure are said. I went up to South Burlington uh, for the boys' uh, soccer championship. And their facility and ours uh, 
started almost within a year or two of each other. And if you saw that facility, it's absolutely magnificent. And I would encourage board members or other people that are going to be moving forward on this project to take a look at that. It's got lots and lots of possibilities and, and it would be inspirational. The second thing is I'm making an assumption and if it's wrong, I'd like to be corrected on it. Um, there are existing facilities out there that I think can be incorporated in the new facility that uh, pole vault, uh, long jump and high jump facilities, I think uh, could be incorporated. The, the second thing is the material that the track is going to be, it doesn't specify exactly what it's going to be. And I would hate to see a simply asphalt track go down there. That would not be a step forward. And the other concern is on the, on the schematic, they have the shot put. If the shot put went where it is, and I don't think this would be the case, but it would preclude playing soccer on that field. So those are concerns that I think will be addressed down the line. But I'm totally overwhelmed. Those of you that know me know that I get emotional. But the, the outpouring of Union 32 and tracksters from my fear just is, is an old trackster. It overwhelms me. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Cody, and definitely take some yeah. little extra time if, if you want. Uh, so my name's Cody. I'm the track and field coach here at Montpelier High School. Um, and as Ezra, Meg were saying, um, track and field is one of those sports where we have a wide range of events. You know, we have about 30 to 35 kids on our team as now, and we have another 70 coming from the middle school. Um, so this program is growing so fast. Um, and as we all know, the benefits of having, especially a rubber track, um, not only for the school, for the community, but one thing I really wanted to touch on was the safety aspect of having a rubber track. Um, it saves a lot of impact on the athletes, knees, hips, ankles. Um, we can drastically cut down on injuries just on having a rubber track. Um, and as Charles was saying, the, the jumping pit is just straight asphalt, um, which is not a great safe environment for my athletes to jump. Um, for example, I just had an athlete today um, sprain their ankle because of the runway and the sand specifically is not sand, it's just dirt. Um, and that is not safe to jump in at all. Um, as well as discus, for example, um, especially when kids are learning their, their rotating motion Sometimes accidents happen. Sometimes that discus falls out of their hand and they have big nets around that discus area so that none of those discus hit other kids and potentially have concussions and injuries and stuff like that. Also, uh, another huge benefit to a rubberized track is just the overall kind of um, competition as well as the improvement that I think a lot of our athletes will see. Um, again, for example, blocks. They have spikes at the very end of those blocks that dig into the, to the rubber surface. And unfortunately, with a dirt track, those blocks slide back when the athletes are pushing off against them. So it's one, it's not safe because they could end up tripping, falling, but they're also not maximizing their full potential, um, with their full speed. Um, and the last thing I want to touch on are the hurdles as well. Um, we do have, you know, some hurdles, but when 10 of them are rusted, um, can't be lifted, they don't fall down exactly. That also is kind of a, a danger issue for athletes who are who want to compete in hurdles. Um, like I have three freshmen who have never done hurdles who look very promising in hurdles. Um, so it'd be nice to kind of have that facility to give them their full potential. Because uh, as a track athlete myself, track was the best thing I've ever done. So. So I want to say. Okay. Thanks, Gary. Thank Tim Nuara. I just uh, I wanted to show up as a community member. Um, also, an avid sportsman, outdoors runner. Um, uh, in transparency, I also help coach the Main Street Middle School team, which I don't know if you've seen the numbers on that or upwards of 80. I don't know what percentage that is of the middle school, but I'm guessing it's a pretty big number. Mm -hmm. um, if you wanna see how that is affecting these kids, um, you're welcome to stop in and, and just watch and help out. 
but uh, it doesn't take too long to realize um, the effect that this whole program and situation has on such a huge percentage of the population of the kids in this community. And so I want to make sure that I put time in my schedule today to, to, to come out, to bring my family out, to say that um, this is something important that we should be standing behind. And thanks. Thank you. Um, Beth Merrill. Hi, thanks again for your service to this community. Um, I'm an eighth generation Vermonter, so the blood of Yankee frugality courses through my veins every day. And I believe that this is a huge investment. And I recognize what a big deal this is and what a, an amazing amount of money and resources it takes. What I worry about is we have lots of issues of the district, right, that we could talk about and focus on. Um, I just don't want to get into where we're, we're delaying something that is needed now. I mean, really, it was needed 20 years ago, right? This is a cohort of kids who were promised a playground in kindergarten and never stepped foot on that playground because it didn't happen in their years at Union Elementary. Um, I think what COVID has taught me is like the time is now and the time to bring us together, exercise our minds, our bodies, and our spirit of community. And I feel like this track is, has the potential to do that. So thanks for considering. Okay. Um, Leslie Wells, uh, even though you're on camera, also just introduce yourself. Uh, good. Yeah. Can you hear me? Oh, wait. Hold on, Leslie. We can't hear you. Okay. If you need to restart your Zoom, we can go to someone else and let you re-plug right, in if you can't speaker. find volume. Oh, it's, I think it's on our end. Thank you, Jim. Just noting that Nathan said it's a little bit. Oh, okay. Leslie, try again. Can you hear me now? Yes. I put you on the list. If, if Sorry that about was, that, uh, Leslie. Of your hand. Oh, that, that's okay. That's okay. It's all part of it. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Leslie Welts. I am a Montpelier resident, and I have a child who's about to matric matriculate Union Elementary this fall, which is very exciting. Um, I am a, uh, a state employee, but I'm a longtime musician and a runner. And I feel like one of the things that um, I've seen in this community is that Montpelier High School is seen kind of as the artsy school and U32 is seen as the athletic school. And this is a way to support the kids who do both in the Montpelier school system is investing in the track. Um, you, you can do both. And uh, it's a, it's it really is just like it's providing infrastructure for the for the kids to to develop that that part of themselves and learn discipline through running and um, community spirit. So uh, sorry, I don't mean to ramble, but I think it's really exciting. I also recognize it's a huge investment and that there's always a lot of budgetary decisions that have to be made. And we would love to do everything we could ever all the time, and we can't. Um, but it does seem like this is a great time to, to put this investment forward. So thank you for your time and thank you for serving on the school board. Okay. Thanks, thank Leslie. Um, Sherry. Um, just before I left for here, I did do a writing, a written comment, but I'd actually ask if you could remove that and replace it with this verbal, if that's possible, I'd appreciate that. Yes. Um, so hello, and thank you too for your service. It's greatly appreciated. My name is Sherry Rock Castle. My son here is a freshman. He shifted from soccer to cross country and track and field when he was in eighth grade last year. And um, one thing I just wanna just draw a picture of is, uh, and why I would really appeal to this track being developed is last year, um, the team had about 50 people in the middle school and an event was put on that hadn't been done. You've heard about the track and field meet. It took about 50 parental volunteers and it was all hands on deck and it was the most fabulous energy that one could like just pick up on from far away and close up. 
And it was just wonderful. However, not sustainable with that many volunteer hours, you know, doing chalk and bringing in all the equipment that we needed. And um, with these numbers, it's just phenomenal. And the accessibility, not only to the variety of events, but to people who don't want to particularly be in a sport where their every move might make the difference for that team versus that freedom of doing their best mm -hmm. and knowing that they're personally driven to do that and um, not so much with that pressure of that one move that like lost the goal or something like that. I just think that our community um, benefits from those types of activities and the running for a kid to like move their body. We all know the mental health aspect of that and how, how just glorious it is for our kids. So the track last year, I remember the slippage being spoken of with my son on that track, that safety stuff that Cody spoke of, you know, I would concur. I just think that um, it's time to give this vast number of student body to the, the benefit of the equipment that would keep them safe. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tim Favorite on, on Zoom. Hi, um, I'm here uh, representing the Montpelier Energy Advisory Committee, um, and I'm just encouraging uh, the school board to explore solutions for getting the high school and the middle school's heating system off of oil. Um, in our net zero energy action plan that the city released late last year, we found that the high school and the middle school burn by far the most oil of all municipal buildings in Montpelier. Um, the high school burns about 30,000 gallons of oil a year uh, and the middle school burns about 22,000 gallons. Um, if Montpelier is going to reach our net zero goals by 2030, uh, it's absolutely critical that we have to that we change this soon. Um, it, the plan was written in 2021, and that was well before the recent spike in oil prices. But it found that heating with, say, a wood chip boiler, as opposed to what we're doing now, would save the district about $55,000 per year in fuel costs. Um, perhaps we could uh, direct some of those savings towards nice things like the track. Um, but yeah, anyway, this is a, a chance to save money by doing our part for the climate. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. <laughs> Nathan, Suter. I want to echo previous speakers in thanking the board and the administration for all the work that they do for the district and for our students. And um, rather than treading over the points that have already been made, I want to <clears throat> tell a story about my own personal journey as I think about the value of track and field and athletics in general to our students. And that is that when I was a first year student in high school, um, like many people at that stage of life in a middle school and later in high school, I was in search of an identity and trying to find uh, you know, who I was, who I wanted to be. I was trying to find a group of people who would recognize me and see me uh, for, for my was. And in my case, at that point in time, that included um, choosing not to drink alcohol and choosing not to experiment with drugs and things like that. And that was, uh, in, the, in my high school, the, the sort of high status kids were into those things. And so if you're, you know, if you're 15 and male and searching for your own version of status and affirmation of your own identity, you are definitely looking for uh, a group that's going to reinforce that. <clears throat> and I joined the track team and that was a, a key to making me who I am today in that I found a group of peers who respected me and respected the choices I was making. Uh, I found a group of people I could invest in and I discovered and developed my own internal discipline, uh, an ethos and uh, a lifelong orientation to how I go about uh, working hard and interacting with other people. Um, and I think that obviously that's not unique to track and field, but I think that the, this is the kind, the reason that we do athletics, the reason we do any sport is for me at least not primarily for competition. It's not primarily to win championships. It is 
to develop our identities and to become full people as humans. And I can't think of a time in life when that's more essential than middle school and high school. Um, obviously, a facility does not make that happen. However, a facility can certainly catalyze it happening for more people and make this into uh, a major component of what our identity is as a district. And, you know, we're talking tonight about the 35 kids who are athletes on the high school team and the 70 nine kids are registered for the middle school that's only this year you know there are 26 fifth graders in the middle school team if we had 20 to 26 students in every class from now for the next 50 years which is more or less what this investment is you know that's a stunning number of students who would be affected directly by the facility and it doesn't even touch on uh, the other sports that would use it the members of the community students from other districts etc so uh, I just I applaud the, the district for considering this and for the board for considering this. And uh, I also humbly present that this is not to me an either or question. This is a both and. Obviously, there are really important priorities, including net zero, that we should be pursuing doggedly. Um, I suggest that those are of a different scale and should be possible alongside investing in a facility like this whose maintenance and upkeep have been probably deferred for 20 or 30 years. And so we might think of this commitment of $1.5 million as, um, you know, just like we would think about refilling the pension funds of the state. It's sort of long overdue in my opinion. Thanks again for your service. Thanks for listening. Take care. And assuming you're not driving, this is in your car, Chris Curtis. Maybe not, Chris, because we have your hand up. Um, Zoom is very hard to navigate on your phone. Yes. <laughs> well, we can come back to you, Chris, if that hand means you want to speak. Um, is, that the is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak who did not? Uh, so we have one hand up, Avery. I'm Avery Smart. I'm the captain of the boys cross country team and uh, distance track team. Uh, I found a new identity when I started running and the track and our facilities uh, play a huge role in what I'm able to do and what the team's able to do. And I think it's just a beautiful sport. It's about pushing yourself to becoming a better version of yourself where you become stronger, you become healthier. And it's, it's really just one of the healthiest sports out there. And it's, um, it's almost primal, just running. Um, and I think that it's really important uh, to the whole team uh, to have nice facilities. And I also think that it could even boost numbers if we didn't have people thinking, oh, I don't want to go run on a mud pit. But instead, if we had a nicer facility, similar to what South Burlington has, or even some of the really small Division three schools like Springfield, um, that would be more inspiring to people and they would be more willing to challenge themselves and better themselves. Um, and one other thing is uh, we're the state capital. It would be amazing if we could host the state championship. And it seems kind of silly that there are schools like Springfield that host the state championship for the longest time where we would go to um, as the capital. Um, and so it would be very nice if we could, I think that's an eight lane track. And I know that it's a lot of money and that there's many considerations, but it'd be very nice if we could host the state meet and that would also bring um, just more people to downtown and that kind of thing. And it would benefit the community too. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <laughs> So Chris, it looks like you're ready to go. And then we have uh, James's iPhone. <laughs> Thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Oh, thank goodness. I got my microphone sorted out. Um, I will be brief, but thank you all very much for taking public comment tonight. And thanks again for your service on the school board. Um, I just want, I sent an email to uh, the board, but I really just wanted to briefly underscore the importance of um, creating a magnet, both for, for families uh, and employers and the economic impact of um, in making this investment, not just in the track, but in what many people in the community feel is very needed, which is a wholesale re redevelopment of the field um, to a turf field that would serve as a magnet and a draw for families and athletes across the state um, and would, of course, benefit our, our local student athletes as well. Um, I just know that there's a real hunger and demand all across central Vermont. Um, many families end up driving to Chittenden County to get access to those kinds of resources and to the extent that Montpelier could consider adding that to this um, major proposed investment. Um, many of those same families would appreciate it and not just Montpelier families, but uh, club families and other players from not just one sport, but lacrosse, soccer, baseball, softball, year round. People will come and shovel, they will shovel the field <laughs> to be able to play in the snow um, and, and play all year round. And currently that option is just not, not available to um, students uh, in central Vermont. So um, just would, would ask uh, respectfully to, to consider, um, you know, if we're gonna dig up the field for a major project like the track to be thinking expansively and efficiently um, to, to spend the capital and the investment um, that will result in, uh, I, I think, a, a huge net benefit to the community for all the reasons that many of the other speakers have already said. And I want to thank the um, student athlete who just presented because I think it's critically important to hear the voices of students um, in these debates and discussions. And so I'm really pleased that some young people turned out. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, James, I'm assuming it's James. Yeah, this is James Eikenberry here. I emailed the board and just wanted to um, share my quick thoughts as well. Sounds like lots of great information has been shared, so I'll try to avoid any duplication. <clears throat> uh, like Nathan, I too had a great positive uh, experience in middle school and high school in track and found it to be just very empowering and gave me a, a healthy group of people to hang out with so that I it reinforced good life choices. Um, and there's a lot to be said for that and giving our students um, good opportunities uh, and, and uh, makes it easier to stay on a good path. So that's that's one of the many benefits of track. It's also an incredibly inclusive sport. Um, people of all abilities and all body types and anybody can do track. And that's, I mean, not quite the same in all other sports. And, you know, there aren't really tryouts for track track loves everyone and takes all comers. And that's a pretty beautiful thing. And I think that we're only gonna find the program to grow because of that. Um, so just, I think it's good for the students, whether they're a track athlete or not. Um, our gym class at the high school would use our track all the time. And uh, my last sort of pro track pitch would be that um, there's a lot of parents who are fired up about this as you are finding from all the emails you've received and the folks that are, are sharing with you this evening. and. We, you know, are folks who, if we can afford to, we'll also make donations. If we can't, we can maybe come out and pitch in and help with some of the work. So I think you'll find um, a, a willing force of, of parents and community members who would find ways to pitch in. And if that could help with costs somewhere along the way, then um, I think that you would find willing hands to do the work. So thanks again. And um, I hope that uh, we can find a way to, to make improvements for the track. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I think that concludes it. Final call. Yes. Hi, I'm Jordan Olson. Um, I've been a track coach for 38 years, uh, coach, and recently I, I volunteered to coach uh, at the middle school. I worked with Nathan. And I coached a little bit here at the high school. And I wrote you a letter speaking about the positive aspects of track and field. But I don't want to talk about that. Now. I want to talk about its history at Montpelier. Montpelier's track program was unbelievable. I get emotional thinking about it now, like Charlie. Charlie Phillips and Romaja 
um, I don't know how many titles, but I know they, they, they won nine division two titles in a row. You have, um, I think there's still one person who is a state title holder overall, maybe, no, not overall state title holder in the distance, but you had several state title holders out of this. There was tremendous athletes out of this school. And they had a wonderful opportunity. And there were also a lot of athletes who weren't so great, but really contributed a lot to this, to the school and to all those titles. And I really uh, just, I think that it would be wonderful to resurrect and bring back the greatness of this Montpelier track program. Thank you. So anyone else? And otherwise we will, uh, well, thank you so much. This was uh, a wonderful outpouring. Um, and it was it was fantastic to hear all the, the great stories and perspectives. Um, on to less exciting things like the consent agenda. Um, to I have and just just for folks to know, we are um, we have two uh, short items. Uh, then we're having a facilities overview by Andrew Larosa. Um, we put the vote for after that just to be in case there are any questions the board had in relation to the facilities overview that um, might be pertinent to, to that vote. Um, so I cannot accurately guess when the vote will take place. It's scheduled for before 8.15. Um, so I just wanted to let people know, because I know you probably may not, may not be planning to stay here all evening, but also probably want to know how it turns out. So. I'm sure word will get out if you want to or need to leave. Um, Jim, do you mind if I just say a quick word of thanks before, because I see people are having to leave. Yeah. I know we, but I just want to thank everybody. I mean, I, I know some of you might need to leave before we actually vote for this, but we, you know, we don't hear a lot from community on a lot of things. And for me and my decision-making process as a board member, it really helps to hear from all of you and to see the level of support coming from the community and it just uh, makes our process so much richer and um, our decision making you know easier so it this is democracy in action and I especially the students I just really want to thank you for um, dedicating your time to coming and speaking to us tonight and I don't know if Orca might be able to do a quick pan but you know this is what <laughs> civic engagement looks like <clears throat> yeah I know. didn't expect to be on tv tonight <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. Oh no, that was that was um, thank you. Um. Yeah, I see most of the track team is here too. So thanks, thanks everyone. <laughs> and the U32 track team. And the U32 track team. Which I team, think is really which, special that you guys came out to support yes. your your um, cross town rivals. <laughs> thanks. Great. Thank you. Um, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? And I think. If you yeah. want to add something to I'll I'll next move to approve the consent agenda with the exception of the draft agenda for the May 4th meeting. Okay, do I have a second for that? I'll second. Um, all in favor? Um, any opposed? And um, Mia, you yeah, I just wanted to offer or make a request to add a couple of things to the draft agenda for May 4th. One being the that Jim and I will have a report back to the board on the conflict resolution work that we started with Carol, just kind of where we're at in that process and what our recommendation is for next steps, including um, uh, maybe using some time of the board retreat for that. So just wanted to put that on there specifically as an um, item for board discussion. And then I wanted to request um, that during the finance committee report time, we um, ask whether or not we can make a contribution to the Vermont Coalition for Student Equity, and if so, how much. So I just wanted to add those to the agenda, if that's all right. Um, 
Do you want to make a motion to approve that approve that agenda with those two items added? Great. So I move to approve the May 4th agenda with those additions. I second. We, That's my motion. Need to do that. I think we just add those to the agenda. I don't think we need a motion. Oh, because they weren't, because oh, it wasn't really in the yeah. consent agenda. Yeah. Okay. It's more, it's more we don't need a motion. Okay. Yeah. Never mind. Um, okay. Standing by. Uh, Merrick and I think Zach is online. Um, student update. And I know that <clears throat> your student update also has some, some track input you've gotten. So, um, out of respect for our track discussion, which is going to occur after this, me and Zach decided to keep our board presentation this week short. And I'd also just like to make the board aware that me and Zach are going to be alternating through each of the item that we have. Yep. Um, with that said, our first uh, item for or our first update for this week is about the MHS vaccination grant. And me and Zach are continuing to figure out how to best uh, allocate these funds with student voice in, in mind. And on that note, we are going to be sending out a survey to students over the next week or so for students to finally vote on the ideas that they would like to see on how to allocate these funds. Yeah, that brings us to our next update, which I think Zach will take over. Yeah, uh, so our next thing is the MSMS listening session. We've got that scheduled um, for April 8th. And that is happening at 1.30 at the middle school. And we're going to meet with a group of students um, to talk about what like concerns they have, just getting a general thoughts, feelings, everything. Um, and board members who are interested in attending are welcome. You can make that time. Zach, what time did you say that was? 1.30. All right, our next update is about uh, the curriculum, which we touched upon last week. We just wanted to say that we're continuing to best figure out how to approach this and that we're meeting with the curriculum director tomorrow to talk about this. Yep. Um, and then our track feedback section, um, I'm gonna also try to keep it short. Um, I appreciate everyone who has emailed and um, come in person and just shared how they're feeling. I think that's really great. Um, and I would encourage the board um, to vote in favor of committing um, the money to, towards the track renovation. Um, we've talked a lot about sports because that's a huge part, but there's also just the community impact it could have. Um, Walking is really easy for some people in terms of it not being super taxing, but still being really um, healthy and supportive. And um, I know there's a lot, a lot of people, I think uh, there's, everyone is, would benefit from it. Um, and I would also encourage um, what was said earlier about trying to do um, both, uh, both focusing on the track as well as keeping net zero in mind as something that's incredibly important to everyone in the community. Yeah. I also have a quick track update or some track feedback. Uh, so as you can see from both the, the like, everyone who showed up and everyone who has sent us emails and given us feedback, we've received significant amounts of support and some objections, but mostly support for this track renovation. And from what we've also heard from our outreach to students, I think it's safe to say that this renovation is seen as widely supported within our school community, which I think is important for the board to consider as they make their decisions. And I just also wanted to say that I personally can or support this renovation, both being a track runner and also with the, that student voice in mind. So thank you. And just, I think our last point is about looking ahead. We just wanted to say that we're going to continue with the agenda items that we talked about last week and also this week. And as I, as we talked about the MSMS listening sessions happening tomorrow, we're meeting with the curriculum director. We're continuing to figure out how best to distribute the MHS vaccination grant. 
as well as a few other things that we talked about last week. So we're just going to continue working on all of these with student outreach in mind, student voice in mind, and just doing our best. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Thanks, guys. Um, questions for American Zach? No, just maybe one point of clarification for folks who aren't uh, familiar. Merrick and Zach are not voting members of the board, which is why they might be saying to us, we encourage you to vote, but using that you <laughs> pronoun instead of the royal we. Um, Andrew, I think you're up for facilities. So um, everyone in your board packet got your facilities report. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'll run through some highlights. A lot of the things that, uh, with, especially with the ESSER funding and some other things that have become, become clear in the last month or so, I just wanna hit some of the highlights. And then if you have any specific questions about what you've read. Um, the uh, first thing I wanna do is, is you know, this is not intended to be every single project, everything that we do, but just to give people a general understanding of where we are and, and some of the projects we focused on and possibly looking towards in the future. Um, the building committee is starting to do building tours and we're setting those up. So it's gonna be great opportunity. So when we're talking about specific projects, uh, people have seen them uh, with their own eyes and can kind of help answer questions if they have any. Um, so I'm gonna start sort of uh, most life safety issues, some of the things that we've hit recently, all of, in about two weeks, all of our camera systems and all of our buildings. Um, Sorry. <laughs> You're fine. You. Um, <laughs> in about two weeks, we're gonna be installing new uh, camera systems at the elementary school and the high school, which means that all of our skills will have new camera systems as of last year. So. That's all, and we've got plenty of capacity to expand, but that's a, a big safety piece that we've been working on and, and sort of the chips have fallen such that we can, we've been able to do that. Um, outside work that we've been doing down at, down at Roxbury, we've taken out the head hitting uh, merry-go-round and, and looking to put in a gaga pit down there. We also went through all the equipment down there and replaced some of the pieces that were out of date or worn. So that, that playground is, is heading in the right direction, which is good. The middle school, I'll hold on for a second. Here at the high school for fields and outdoor stuff, um, we have been able to, um, when we took over the fields uh, maintenance from the city, uh, we invested heavily in equipment with tractors and drags and um, mowers and things of that nature. So we're in great position on that to be able to take care of our own facilities. It's a little bit, you know, we go out there in that nice weather and we go, oh, this should be nice and green. Oh, it's still mid-April, so it's, uh, we'll get there. Um, we're usually not on the fields until after the April break. So, but we're in good shape with equipment to take care of that. Um, we have ordered covered benches for the soccer and baseball field. They have, they're coming from England. Uh, Matt may know where they are within the shipping process, but they have been, they have been ordered and are on their way. Um, over the last year, some of the other improvements that we've done, uh, we rebuilt the baseball pitching mound. Uh, we're gonna be redoing the infield there. Uh, we're working with some of the folks on the track team with regards to a discus throwing pad that should be uh, ready to be used uh, when the students get back in April, over the April break. Um, and we're ongoing, again, just sort of ongoing maintenance and, and bringing the fields up. Um, the mud lot, that as a practice field actually turned out better than I think anybody expected it to be. It's not a game field, but it's certainly viable for practice. And um, we're gonna keep fertilizing it and getting it greener and greener and greener. So that's good. Uh, some of the energy project, energy related projects that we've been working on. Down at Roxbury, we have bids in and uh, for both putting in some heat pumps down there. We weren't able to do the whole school, but we're able to take care of the uh, back portion that has the most need for control and dehumidification. So we'll be able to take care of about four or five classrooms down there um, 
well, let's put it three three classrooms and a couple. Not many more classrooms. Yeah, I was gonna say there's, there's more classrooms. Than about three classrooms and in, in the admin office, and we can add to that in the future. We're also putting in a uh, DDC control system down there right now. You set the temperature to 71 degrees, and it's 71 degrees from October 1st until April, whatever. Uh, the DDC control system will allow us to program night setbacks, vacation setbacks, and be able to monitor the uh, the building remotely, which is huge for uh, Tom Allen and our custodial crew. So that that work is going. We've uh, we've ordered equipment, um, and the installation is planned for this summer. Um, I'm gonna, I should put the caveat on anything I say we're doing because lead times and all that are crazy. But we've got, I think we've got an early enough start that we'll have that in place uh, before school starts. Uh, here at the high school, uh, the circulator pump replacement project is complete. And um, that's a huge, it doesn't, it's not all that sexy, but it's a huge amount of energy savings that it's going to generate. Um, it's one of those projects, you know, you got a good project when Efficiency Vermont says, we're not going to give you any money for it because you're going to reap the benefits. Uh, you don't need, you don't need our support. Uh, the DDC control system here at the high school is also going to begin um, after immediately after school starts. They'll probably do a little bit of scouting out over the April break, but that work will begin over the over the summer. So that'll be ready for the fall. Again, huge being able to control the building is going to be huge. Um, so with regards to ongoing projects, uh, we have gone through and selected three classrooms down at Union Elementary, a couple at uh, Main Street Middle, the planning room and some behavioral spaces down at Roxbury that we're going to do the general summer uh, refresh on. We are not taking on any major projects this summer, just knowing that we've got a big load of work coming next year and we might as well bundle it. Plus with new custodians in those buildings and new principals, we didn't want to open any cans of worms that we couldn't close. So I was really, really, really wanted to do the auditorium at the elementary school this summer because it's just going to be fabulous when it's done. But I don't think Katie would have appreciated a half built auditorium when she got there on <laughs> September 1, July 5th. Um, so those are some of the, uh, that's the typical projects we've got going. I want to address some of the larger projects that we should anticipate and certainly we're getting questions about. And um, with regards to the ESSER projects, and Grant, if I forget one, let me know. So at Union Elementary, now we've received conceptual approval on these projects, which we're taking as a, let's get going. Um, so, and when I say let's get going, we're probably really not gonna get into the design of this until September. Nobody's got the capacity now, people need their summers. So we're gonna hit it hard in September, go through the design process. Um, and I, I used to say, go out to bid. We're probably gonna have to do some sort of construction management process. Just nobody's gonna give a bid for materials three, four months out. It's just, it's just not gonna happen that way. Things aren't going to calm down, I don't think, by then. But we'll we'll get to that. So at Union Elementary, the special ed suite, revisioning of that and how that operates and how that can serve the students better. Uh, there is the multi-purpose rise behavioral space that's above for some of you and lots of you students there know is the four winds room, redoing that space. Um, the little gym, renovating that, making that much closer to an actual little gym. Um, at Main Street Middle, cafeteria, kitchen space, renovating that. Um, also, we've started the planning because we actually are going to build the Thrive space over there this summer. That has to get done for the start of school. So we've already started on that and uh, working with contractors and that'll we'll have that in place for the start of school. And another big piece over there is the playground, which I think we actually probably want to call something other than a playground because it serves the youngest fifth grader to the oldest eighth grader. So we need to create an appropriate space over there. Um, high school here, we've got some ESSER three money for, um, for student uh, support spaces over here, but it's a smaller piece and it's more furnishings as it is as, it is as much a renovation. So those are, those are the ESSER projects, the ESSER three projects. Sort of big capital fund projects that have been on the books are the, the renovation of the auditorium, uh, at Union Elementary, 
Um, and we have, I have met with contractors and designers on that process, on that project, and it looks good. I think what we wanted to do was feasible, so that, that's good. We're continuing with the windows over there, actually met with uh, some window contractors and actually uh, had a good tour with the building committee over there just to kind of understand what I'm looking at and some of the things we're struggling with, not struggling, but trying to decide what, what um, direction to take on those. So it's great to have their input on that. Um, so that's continuing. Um, the other big capital piece that's over there or that that's on the books is the sustainability classroom over at Main Street Middle School. Um, so that again, is gonna be something that I, um, we'll, we'll hit that hard in September and really get the right group of people to think about the, what we need in there and, and piece it together and get it out to the, so that's kind of a, that's kind of a overview above and beyond what's in there. And again, I wish I had had this in, but this stuff has been so flowing. Um, the other thing I, I can't stress enough is, is, um, how grateful I am to our custodial staff. They've done an amazing job this year. I don't think anybody other than maybe Grant who, who signs the paychecks realize how hard all of them have been working and how many hours they have been putting in. And uh, to be in a time as challenging as it is as it's been and have the buildings not suffer for that and in some cases improve for, from it um, is a testament to their and their hard work. Was there any specific questions out of who read the whole 71 pages? <laughs> I'm not sure. I'd, I'm not sure I'd raise my hand with pride on that one. <laughs> if there's, if you haven't gotten a chance to read the whole thing, don't hesitate to shoot me a question. I mean, it really, it's, and I, I took the draft off, but I need to get it out there so you guys can ask me the questions yeah. that I can put in here and put the answers. This is a living document and Whoever sits in my office from here forward should be doing this for you because the, the heavy lifting is the first time. Once you get it done, then it's just updating, but it, it's hugely, it's a good resource if we use it. Yes, it is. Yes. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Um, questions for Andrew, if we've got a couple. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I first wanted to say thank you for writing it. I know the heavy lift was mostly last year when you created it in the first place, but I also know it takes a lot to go through a 72 page document and update it. So thank you very Anna, much. Anna also. Gets and Anna, <laughs> thank you, Anna. Thank you um, for, you know, establishing this overview for us to give us this comprehensive look of our, at our facilities and for the large amounts of work that it takes to keep our buildings running. And I also, wanted to take the opportunity to echo the kudos and the reflections on the custodial staff. I think it's also very cool that you include that in our facilities report. Um, and I would love to see this on the website, that it's something that lives on the facilities page of the website, because I think our, our community would also benefit from having this overview. And it would be hard to remember now what board meeting was that where Andrew presented it, I have to go, you know, so I think that that, that would be a, um, a good way of, of having these, the, um, uh, you know, community be part of taking care of our buildings. Um, there, the pages nine to 10, you have the future projects. You kind of touched on that a little bit in your overview. Um, how, I, this might get too granular for this discussion tonight, but it, I, it would be helpful to know how much of this is already included in budgeting, ESSER um, funds, what you, maybe what you would be saying to the board, hey, I know you don't have a pack capital plan for FY24, but you know. Uh, so I look at this at the middle school and I look at most of it is going to be addressed in the next year or two. Okay. Um, so, so I, yeah, I think if you go through, so Roxbury, the general update, upgrade, upgrade to classrooms, the casework upgrade, that's, that's sort of a classroom thing that's ongoing. The mechanical, I think we've touched on that. So I would say a lot of this, you know, I think it's a. Um, I think most all of it is in some way addressed. Okay. If not, if not fully, at least to some level. Okay. So by by future projects, you're saying future to get done, but we've already kind of laid it out. Yeah. You know, yeah. Okay. These are these are things I've heard. These are projects I've heard, and I think I put it up there as you know some of the ideas, some of the things that we've heard that okay. hopefully we're, we're you know 
as okay. we go through, because it's it's a process of every year we sit. There's like um, health, safety, and welfare. There's like no question on that. That we try to address as quickly and as completely as we possibly can. Um, when it comes to program space and classrooms and all that, we talk about it in September when we're putting together the budget with Grant. And by this time, teacher, people are moving, class is changing and all that. So we, we sort of adjust as we go. But mm -hmm. again, everything that's sort of listed on there is either stuff that we've heard or is actually going to be taking place. And, <clears throat> and obviously the, the, bar, the bigger projects take more conversation than just my office or, you know, there's lots of voices on that one. Of course. Of us, yeah. Right. There were a number of things in the report where you noted should be adequately funded. So this is maybe just like a follow up to this question. How do we know if they are being adequately funded? Uh, because I'll reach out to Grant and uh -huh. we'll talk about them. You know, right. if there's a, if there's a real concern and it is a balancing act. We, as others have said, we'd love to do everything right yeah. now and we can't really do that. Um, so we have to pick and choose. And, you know, a lot of those maintenance, it's just that those should remain adequately funded or just a reminder <laughs> to us that okay we gotta we gotta keep on top of these things okay that's um, helpful for how we should be reading yeah, it from the board perspective read, yeah read it as you know don't forget about that one that one we okay it, it, it takes a lot it's, it's nothing's cheap no <laughs> certainly not um and then my last one was just on the green buildings in general sure. um it's a little bit less of a question for you and more for the board that you know this is another aspect that we have heard a lot from the community on and i think that our we as a board need to decide how much of a priority we're going to make getting to net zero is and i would love to see that live with the facilities committee for now at least and then the facilities committee help us you know be the place where sort of that like research kind of thing lives and then have <coughs> us and then bring it to the board to decide in the end, you know, how much of a priority are we going to make it? Meaning, do we have a policy? Do we have, you know, that will, I think, give our administration the direction that would be really helpful at this point, because clearly you've done many things without our direction, which is great it, that, you know, we're more of the like no brainers, but it's what I'm hearing is that we're getting to a point now where the solutions are a lot more complicated. And so we could provide a little bit more of a framework. So that was less for Andrew and more for yeah. us. <laughs> That's it. That's a very good that. Thank you. I have a little tickle in my throat, but and I've been testing every day for COVID just so you know. <laughs> um, I also just want to thank you for creating the facilities report. I don't know what we had before. It does live on our website under the facilities committee. Oh, the committee. Ah, <laughs> I didn't look there. I looked on the facilities page of our website. Yeah, so thank but, you. But it only goes back to last year, and I'm guessing that's because Andrew is the designer of this document. I don't know if if yeah. there was. <laughs> so I just want to thank you for improving the transparency of your process and the district's process around sort of prioritizing projects and what we've recently put money into and what we're planning to put money into in the future. And you can go and find it on our website on the facilities and energy committee page. Um, but you've improved that. I, I, I wasn't here before before you, but it seems like 100%. So thank you so much for that. And when I would encourage um, people to access those documents, because as we were hearing feedback on the track, a lot of the things that we were hearing feedback on were things that actually had recently been either paid for or earmarked or will be paid for in the very near future. And so, <clears throat> and I don't expect people to follow along <laughs> you know that in that way but if they're interested and they have the the time and energy um it's a good document to sort of dig into and hopefully as we move forward we're going to be having many years to like look back on and, and compare the different types of projects that we've done and i think that's a, a great service that you've done for the district and i i have appreciated it in a few different decisions that have come across our desk um, and I and the other question that I had was actually answered in your answer to Mia. So more of just a thanks. Other questions <clears throat> for Andrew. But the first one is um, for MSMS, the cafeteria, kitchen, and the playground. I guess in the Thrive space, 
Are those this summer projects or next summer projects? Next summer. Brian, Brian will be this summer, so we're ready for the start of school for those days. But the others, <clears throat> that process is going to take, and all of these processes are going to take a long time. So. Yeah, yeah. But our goal is to, um, and then, um, would a feasibility or a vi viability study be the type of thing that might occur to a Address the possibility of replacing oil heat. Is that the way that it might be approached? Would that be an expensive thing? Would it be a not, not worth? Is that no, something it would the board be. I mean, do? absolutely, Just absolutely. To figure out because there are and timelines and variables because we're not even aware of necessarily the variables involved at this point. Um, as much as the community won't, would like, you know, some folks are saying take care of this, but it doesn't seem like there's a path and maybe there's a, yeah. No, I, I would, I, I agree that if that was a, a commitment or a, a, at least a, a goal that wanted to be explored, there are 10 different ways to get there and each of them has an impact and we need to understand those impacts. And I can, I can understand facility impacts. I, uh, but I, I couldn't do that kind of a report that sort of looked at all the different options, what the costs are, what the paybacks are. Although with net zero, you're not really looking at paybacks. So, you know, but that is a piece of it. Um, it is, that's a, that's a big chunk of work. And it's something that does need to be brought out and, and done by an expert because they need to look at all the, all the infrastructure, how you'd make it work. And then we'd also have to look at it like I say, for ourselves, how do we make it operational? How do we, how do we get it to work within our facilities? So it is, it is beyond me sitting in my office thinking about how can we make this net zero? So just, just as a follow-up, just the viability aspect would probably have to go into next year's budget because it's, it's, it's not a small, it's not a just even just the, the feasibility aspect of it would probably have to be, and I'm kind of looking up to Grant as well, Sort of. I would think so. I would think so. Absolutely. Because you're hiring engineers. Well, I, and I think we also, and I think it's probably a test for the facilities and energy. Committee. I mean, I think we need some extra help on what it is. I mean, a lot of people talk like, you know, we can replace our oil burner with a wood burner. Well, there's, there's problems with wood burners and there's problems with wood burners around carbon. Um, I mean, the reason that wood burners are technically net zero is because the tree grows back, but the tree grows back in 80 years. So you put that carbon in the air now. You, know, you look at the models, we don't have 80 years of carbon in the air to deal with. So we could spend you know, a million plus dollars on a new burner and had a effectively you know, no measurable carbon impacts and perhaps worse carbon impacts. And then there's habitat effects of the wood burner too. So we need to figure out a lot of, of questions before we start making decisions around that zero. So we, we don't even, I think, yeah, we haven't even begun to have, to have some of the basic answers. I mean, we have we have some stuff we're doing that's good, but oh, yeah, some absolutely. of the larger problems, um, and we need a lot of work on. One one last piece, and, and I we try to we we've got to do a better job of communicating this. That absolutely, we are the biggest oil users in the city, but we also have two thirds of the building stock in the in town. So as a sort of on a square footage, we're actually we do a darn good job. Can we do better? Absolutely, but. I, I, when we hear that, you know, we, we burn the most, we do the burn the most, but we've got most of the buildings and uh, in relative to, and even look at our hours of operation. And that, like, it's questions like that. How do you define, do you do it by square foot or do you do it by square foot and hours of operation? Because this building is operational from seven, six in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. You compare that to a, a city building, they're going nine to five. So, and I can't, I'm in no way in a position to answer that question either even. So, um, so do we can do better, but we're doing pretty good. And like Grant has said, all of our this is all solar in all of our buildings. It's all solar, and our and our usage has gone down by thirty percent in the last ten years of electrical use. So we're even using not only is it all solar, we're using less solar panels to do it. So, yeah, I just want to follow up with the you know, connecting back to Ian that and also you were saying that I really just feel that this is. <laughs> the meat it is the work of the facilities and energy committee mm -hmm. and we are a fairly young committee we were you know we were initiated i think um, in march of 2021 
And we had a couple great high energy kickoff meetings and honestly, a lot of energy efforts just got swallowed up with pandemic dynamics. And I'm happy to say that we are back at work and we, you know, we are in the midst, like Andrew said, we are now uh, touring the buildings. We, the, the hope and intention is to have all buildings toured um, by the end of June. Um, and I think we realize that these are really big things and the plate of work in front of us is really significant. And Andrew, I appreciate at the one of the last meetings that you tasked us and said, it's time. It's time that we need to really come to the table and start really thinking about, um, you know, this inventory of priorities and projects and start to make some decisions and understanding how, you know, the, the funding is flowing and, and really what the priorities are. So there's a lot of there's a lot of big work ahead of us, and I, I hope I'm speaking for the committee at large that you know we're eager to get this work underway and get down to to brass tacks. And I think that um, this this um, facilities report is is such an incredible starting point for us. I mean, it's really like a, a a map to get oriented within the district, and it is incredible. It's an incredible resource and. Um, so very, very grateful for it. And um, I think it just gives us, you know, the starting point context. Um, and I, I wondered too, if in the report, we, there was a way to, you just verbally kind of went down the list of all of the efforts that have been done within like the um, kind of energy infrastructure and, and efforts. And if we could like tease those out um, and put that in one section so that we had a, a place to see it. And that's maybe certainly something that the energy committee, the facilities and energy committee could help with. Um, but it would be great to see all those things in, in one place. Um, and, and then just, um, I know you were saying there's projects that you've heard about um, I just wanted to add to the list, uh, you know, when we were doing a lot of community feedback for the ESSER process in the fall with Roxbury community members, we did hear a lot of clanging around a desire to see an outdoor covered space um, in the schoolyard that could support and facilitate outdoor education, um, you know, community gathering space, student graduations. Um, I know it had initially been Earmarked as a project when we were thinking maybe some infrastructure funds would funnel in, but I don't I don't think that's happened in terms of the federal um, infrastructure bill. We saw that on the list of projects in August. Um, it's not there now, and I just wondered. And I know that project is possibly connected to the drainage in the schoolyard, and there's some challenges with that. So I wondered, has the drainage issue? Is that I don't see it on the list. Is it something that we need to think about, or that you're thinking about? And you see this project. On the you are horizon. rotten. We, you, we, we are at the absolute lowest point in that town. Yeah, <laughs> that schoolyard, bottom of the valley. And I wish there's a drain pipe we could put somewhere, but I don't know <laughs> where it would be. Yeah, I honestly don't know. Yeah. The good thing is, yes, it's absolutely a lake, but it dries up quickly. Yep. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. I was down there three, last time I looked at it specifically. It was a few weeks ago, and it was a quarter of the back. Of the park of the playground, I wouldn't be surprised if that was dried out by now. Yeah, but it's just a challenge. Luckily, it perks. That's we're so lucky on that one. But right. just want to observe. Um, generally, I think I hope to see the the district and Lindy all really. There's so much good work being done. So I really want to point. I want to really hope that we can figure out a better way to draw attention to a lot of the good work. And I want to recognize that, based on what I see here, that RVS is a really solid fit. Yeah, it's, it's like a really solid, not not. It's it's a it's a it seems to be. There are some small things that the community would like, but it seems like, as far as it merging into the district, that it's not a great deal of burden to you. Um, as it is, you know, it seems very. I just want to observe that it's it's a, it seems like as far as buildings go, it's a strong building it's well put together it's 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 and that's a, just a nice thing i just want to toot the horn of the rvs there because i'd like to see more horn tooting <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you're right though right it is a, it's a solid solid yeah, building. It's very yeah. solid building i just wanted to quickly add something if I could. good good um it's something that Andrew had said at previous meetings that really stuck with me in talking about um, the net zero and the green building piece is some of the things that can really make the biggest difference are either not as exciting or sexy uh, or as seemingly, you know, in your face, but have incredible impacts and also um, human behavior, things like driving and things, like, you know, there's, there's a lot of pieces to making our community 
more energy efficient and I'm by far not a net zero expert, but an example is I know we got some kind of eye rolls from the community about spending money on windows. Well, if anyone's like ever bought a house in Vermont or rented an apartment in Vermont and had better windows put in, like that's one of the most important things you can do. Um, it may not seem particularly exciting, but there is sort of that adage of like make do or do without, like there are things that are happening in the school that this crew has been working on that are making those incremental differences without us doing something that might seem like a big splash. Um, and I also, you know, I also definitely hear the um, request for changing our heating system, but I also feel like at least at MSMS and MHS, we use every square inch around these buildings. I don't see a lot of places to put some of those things without giving something up. And I know we're going to be talking about the track and about fields. I don't really see that we have a lot of room for some of these things. So that is not a failure in any way. Um, I just think it's really important to realize that some of these less exciting things that may not seem visible to the naked eye are actually having a really big difference on our efficiency. Um, so. Yeah. I mean, the, the energy, the electrical savings, the 40% the, the was not done out of some big project. It was just a conscious effort of we're going to, anytime we replace a light bulb, we're going to do it with an LED. And it was just what we did. Nobody, and we're just continuing to do that. Uh, I just wanted to kind of add to the, the window thing. I've, I've heard stories from people who work in the UES or MSMS. But there are some windows you can put a, a glass of water next to in winter and it will it will freeze by the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, like window fixing is an eye roll until you're someone who has to like sit next to that window for you know, eight I'm hours. I'm looking a day. at Julie over there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, I just final. So that 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 all these big projects and all this good work we're going to have, it's really not going to start in earnest until next fall with design, and we'll have to talk about the right way to get the right people in the room to talk about this and the process, and we're going to lay that out nice and clear. It will truly. I don't want to make any promises as to it's all going to get done next year. It's all going to get, but it, but the ESSER money has to be spent by September of twenty four. So it's the next two summers that this is going to work on, and it's, and it's really going to be. What do we got and how do we move and how do we work around the work? Summer 23 and 24. You mean, summer. You say next two summers. Yeah, yeah, 23 and 24. Yeah. So. Other questions for Andrew? We may. We may right, one quick question, um, uh, Andrew. Thank you so much for that amazing work and that report and all your knowledge um, and to everybody. The, do you anticipate any like surprises with the SR3 work? Um, so we have the little gym, the playground, the thrive space. You know, I'm just thinking of like what happened at UES with the playground. Is it like we're gonna open something and they're like, ah, we're gonna need another 500,000 for something? Um, or is that pretty much? I'm looking at it as we have the money allocated towards that. That doesn't mean we're going to, and, and Libby and Grant can look at me differently, but we've got this bundle of money and we've allocated project to project. We're going to bring it all together. And when it comes in higher than the amount that we've got, we will sit and say, okay, well, maybe we can do a little less here and shift it to this because this is a higher priority. There's going to be a little bit of a shell game, but Fundamentally, there will be these improvements and they will be valuable improvements. Um, again, there is, these are old buildings, so there's always gonna be surprises. Um, but <laughs> any improvement we make to the little gym is gonna be a massive improvement. So that's the, that's the good thing on these projects is any improvement's gonna be a massive improvement. Thank you. Um, other questions for Andrew? Sorry, I was just watching the screen. Thanks. Thanks. I, Thank you so much. I, I, might, I might not go too far. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> um, so here's here's how I'm going to to handle the the board action. I would actually like a, a motion and then handle the discussion and discussion on that motion rather than have an open ended discussion <laughs> without a motion. So um, and we can amend the motion as as we see fit, but. Um, do I have a motion to approve the administration's request to 
allocate $1.5 million for a track. I move to allocate $1.5 million for the track. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Discussion. Um, and I don't know how to handle that, Lydia. I don't know if you, I know you've got some questions about email. If you just kind of want to go through and maybe see if you can answer a lot of those. Sure. And then we can can open it up to further questions. And I would like to invite my partners in crime to the chairs right in front. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you. Yes, you too, Mr. LaRosa. Thank you. So you can add your brilliance. Matt is also on the, yeah. If we need him, he wasn't feeling too well tonight. So, uh, so one of the questions that was sent to me is, is this the best use? What else did you consider? And I just want to remind the board that we've had tons of conversations over the past year of infrastructure projects and needs um, ever since we knew a considerable amount of federal money was coming in. And so this, when we, when you, when I'm asked, what else did we consider? We considered the small gym. We consider the, um, you know, all the, the cafeteria and, and kitchen renovation at MSMS. All of those things were under consideration. It's our job knowing all the funding sources that are available to us, which funding sources work for what, right? So if the board remembers, we started talking in the very beginning about using all of the ARP ESSER or ESSER three for windows. That was our first go at it. We got a lot of feedback about that from the community. We got feedback from uh, the Agency of Education about, hey, I'm not sure that's gonna be an allowable expense for that. Um, and so we had to rethink what we wanted to do. So we moved that back into the capital fund, which was the plan prior to us knowing our professor was here. So when, it's, when we're asked, what else did we consider? The track is part of that long laundry list of projects that we've been talking about for quite a long time. Um, as a school board, it's just figuring out which funding source goes best with which um, project. Uh, so eventually we came down to it that the fund balance, the best use of the fund balance would be for the track. Uh, so that was that's kind of how I'm thinking about that piece. Um, trying to read my chicken scratch here, sorry. Um, why not commit the whole 2 million? Uh, Grant gave me some really easy math to consider for this. So I appreciate that Grant. I wanna um, say that this, this estimate for the grant is just that, or for the track, sorry, is an estimate. We don't know exactly how much it's gonna cost because we haven't designed it yet. Um, so this is a best guess estimate from Andrew working with the engineers out there do, with that feasibility study, which is a three-page document. You know, this three-page document is not the design of a track. So it's a three-page feasibility study with the space out there. So this is our best chance, best ballpark estimate. We're also working off, and Grant, please correct me if I get this wrong, but we're also working off what we know the fund balance to be, what we're estimating the fund balance to be at the end of the third quarter for this year, not for this full school year but for where we are at the third quarter mark, because the, the third quarter, well, Grant hasn't done that with the finance committee, it's coming up very soon. Um, so he's got a good guess because he's Grant, he's awesome. Um, so we're looking at those potential numbers. So um, Grant sent me this math that right now, currently there's 3.8 million in the fund balance that we're planning on using 1.1 million as a revenue source for our budgets through FY26. That's just a planned revenue source. Um, we already have half a million for encumbered funds for things like the heat pumps and some other projects that Andrew was, has in his facilities report. So that leaves um, an anticipated as of the third quarter of 2.2 million. In policy, in the school board's policy, we have a 2% set aside. So that's another half million that is part of the policy that we need to have in our fund balance. Um, and so that leaves 1.6 million available to commit right now based on the numbers that we have. Um, so Grant, do you wanna add anything to that or did I get that math formula down? You got it perfect. The 2% the is just a goal, mind you. It's in policy, but it's in policy as a goal. So that is where that particular number, number came from, from both the estimate of the feasibility study and what we think we have available or what we, we estimate we have available in the fund. Um, and then the last one is, should we include a turf field? 
with any project that is this brand, and I'll let Andrew talk more about this because he can be a little bit more articulate than I can. But I, I know from our experience with the auditorium and, and playground and things, any, any project that this much money, you have what I call add-on, which may, may not be the accurate term. My layman's term for it is an add-on. And you have a bulleted list of add-ons. So for instance, the uh, covering the seats, upholstering the seats in the auditorium at MHS was an add-on. That wasn't originally part of the, the original plan. But when we had extra time and money, we decided which add-ons to include in the project. So right now, we're, the turf is not part of the, you know, feasible, it wasn't part of the feasibility study done. It doesn't mean that it's not going to be on there. And it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to be an add-on. It could be something else. But that's part of the design part of this, I would argue. Um, and we're... As uh, you know, I do my workout every morning, and the workout person goes, "We're you're not there yet. Don't worry about it yet." <laughs> so we're not there yet with the uh, turf field. But Andrew, do you want to add anything onto that? You're absolutely right. This 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 original report was just a feasibility. Just we had talked about the track. I mean, there'd been a lot of talk about the track. And before we got sat and my had this vision of someone sitting in the room saying, "Should we do the track? Let's vote on it tonight," and not knowing whether we could actually do it. This was just sort of a proof that yes, if we wanted to do it, and absolutely that, like like any of these projects, like the special ed suite or whatever, if if the intent is to explore it further and look at it, we're absolutely going to have to look at all that. If if we do an eight, if we do an eight lane track, what does that look like? What's the effect of that? If we do six and, and an eight straight away or whatever, we have to go through these and run through these. And uh, ideally, there's a group of that is put together to help explore those options that can make reasonable decisions and come back with a proposal that says, yeah, actually went through it and looked at all that. And it just goes to a point that we don't think the public would be, would want it. We couldn't hold a state meet because we don't have enough parking to hold a state meet. And, you know, those kinds of things to come back and say, this actually is the real project that, that we think is the, the most viable. And if there's ads to that project that could easily be done, then those could be part of that as well. But as Libby said, this is just the starting point um, to this, and there's still a lot of work to be done. I think those were the questions that you sent me. Yeah. Right. Anyway. Um, other questions, comments? Yeah, I have a few questions. Um, and more about the process about how we got here. Um, one was like, how much was it the feasibility report that was done? Um, uh, and, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm just thinking about the timeline and if there are any specific plans to ensure there is a, an audit on access, accessibility plans for our kids with disabilities, neurodiverse, that will benefit from this tract. Um, how do we prioritize the voices of the amazing people that put this forward, um, you know, against the voices of people that we've heard from net zero, literacy, not against, but like how, what is our process as a board to make those decisions? Um, and then, yeah, what, what are the consequences of not deciding tonight are some of my basic questions tonight. Was your first question, Amanda, how much money was the feasibility study? Yeah. About $10,000. Thank you. Uh, and then uh, some other questions, places like the literacy, literacy um, special education, all of that feedback that the board has received. We as uh, the board will remember in other presentations that I've done, we are doing work towards that. So those aren't in competition, the track and those that work is not in competition with each other um, in any way, shape or form. So other areas that I've spoken about in previous board meetings address um, the work that we're, we're working towards with that piece, those pieces, I should say. And then the accessibility, we, we wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be able to create any type of structure without it being accessible. Um, it's just, it's, we're not allowed to do that. So in, in the, just as a, as a first step in that we've, we've got a concrete sidewalk that runs to the parking lot to the bleachers. So we are already thinking about that, even at the 40,000 foot level. Um, 
And so individual features, that's exactly why you have a design committee to get together to address those. And our current track, I would argue, because of the uneven surface and the, the gravel um, is not necessarily accessible at the moment. So this would be a great upgrade for accessibility purposes going forward. Did I answer all your questions, Amanda? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, and it was, and this was more like for the, for also for the board, for Jim as the chair of how like we move these things forward. And then, uh, yeah, what are the consequences of not deciding that this today? And um, just like, because I am, I'm just thinking of process of getting here like this. You know, well, I, I can't give an all-inclusive answer, but I can give you my perspective. Number one is, until we have some money available, then we can't really have Andrew set somebody free on doing more design work and getting deeper into this. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. So we can't do that until we have some money that's committed. The, the other thing is, I'm looking at this more from just the safeguarding the district's fund balance and our assets. You don't have to do this now. If you do do it, it's not a final decision. You can uncommit, like I mentioned last time. But I strongly urge the board to commit a significant amount of money before June 30th because I'm concerned that it becomes a big target. For so clawback. That's my, that's what I'm trying to make sure happens before I leave here is that the money is committed and is safeguarded. This to me is a, is a good thing to put it against. Um, and as you go along, as Andrew said, if something pops up and you decide this isn't what we wanna do, well, then you can uncommit whatever's left. Um, it's not like we're gonna spend $1.4 million in the next couple of months. So I would like to see it set aside. I think it does um, give us uh, the ability to start moving forward. It is a commitment right now that, that you are saying you really feel important. This is important and we should move forward. But if something should change, you can turn that back with the exception of whatever money we have spent against it so far. Yeah, and I, I want to go to process too. I mean, this this has been part of a discussion for, I think as Libby laid out in, in various contexts for, for over a year. I think we've had quite a bit of discussion and, and quite a bit of opportunities to to ask queries and including the last two meetings. I mean, we can, I think we can always improve process, but um, I, I think we've had a pretty comprehensive process on, on this. Kristen? Yeah, I had sent an email about earlier today. Grant, you addressed um, a number of my questions already, but it was more around process, just in terms of the commitments of funds process. Um, I'm wondering what is the, bo the board's role on this beyond the commitment of funds? Is there a final like go ahead uh, the administration would need to receive from the board to officially initiate, you know, like a, a you know, more significant aspect of the project, um, you know, or is once it's committed, is it sort of off and running? Like, will you need, will we need to make a decision on this again? other than just committing the funds. Mm -hmm. When you commit the funds, it doesn't like, we're not gonna go off and spend $1.5 million without you knowing anything. What happens is the board is responsible for approving contracts, any contract over $50,000. So you would see if all of a sudden we start going off to the races with, you know, you would see it. Mm -hmm. um, so really the, the expense that, that we would start incurring you might not know about unless you're seeing it in your quarterly reports or asking questions are some of the design and, and engineering work as we start trying to plan it out. Yep. So that's it. Um, when we got to the point where we were actually awarding any kind of significant contract, we would have to come to you by policy through our, our bidding and, and contract policy. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, and then briefly, what's the process for uncommitting funds? Is it essentially just reverse voting to uncommit the funds, basically the reverse of what we're doing now? Yep, somebody yeah. would make a, a motion to uncommit X number of dollars that had been committed for such and such a purpose. Okay. That would be or, or to repurpose it, or to repurpose Or true, to, to commit it to something in lieu of what it was. Okay, um, my next question you already answered. Um, and are there any categorical, categorical limitations to what fund balance can be used for? 
or is it basically up to like, is there any, are there any types of projects things that are not eligible for use of fund balance? You can use fund balance for anything you can use the general fund. For. Okay. So no, I mean, um, we might need to check with the agency because it's a project to make sure that there's no issues with that. But a lot of times that's only if you're going after state funds for, for getting reimbursed, which we, we wouldn't be in this case. So no, uh, as long as it's, if it was something we were gonna spend our general fund money on, we can spend our fund balance on. That's uh, something that the public has given you the authority through a, an annual warning article. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And I, I will say there's there's been a few people that have asked the question, if you commit 1.5 and the project costs more, which right now the estimate was more, I, I realize that, and it could be significantly more depending on what else gets thrown in there. Um, that's whenever we would start looking at, okay, how much more? And then what are the options? Like um, Libby mentioned, I'm doing the third quarter report. This is for 1.5. I think after I'm done with the third quarter report, I may say that there's there might be another couple hundred thousand or so that might actually be available too that, that would ca cause no harm. Um, the other thing is that 2% is about half a million dollars. That's a goal. If we were uh, $100,000 short and you wanted to use some of that money, you certainly could because it's just a goal, which most districts don't have that flexibility. Um, the other thing is, say we were a quarter million dollars short, well, we could next year when we're cap doing the capital plan, we could say, you know what, we're going to push windows one more year and stick the track in for FY24 and get a quarter million. There are definitely ways that we could bridge that gap once we finish with priorities. Um, there are ways we can figure out and address that difference, but if you set aside one and a half million, that's a big chunk of the problem we don't have to solve um, when the time comes. So, is there a question, Mia? Yeah. Uh, good, good mind reading, Grant. Uh, Jill. Another question was: um, Is there a, a debt that we have to look interest on that that this would also be a possible expenditure for? Yeah. Um, so, Sorry, I've given up. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Um, so one, the only thing that comes to mind would be bond payments that we have. And we have four bonds. Um, one is for when we bought into Beamer, so that you can't pay off early. One is an old one from like 2008 that is not eligible. So there's two bonds. One was a $2.3 million bond from 2013, I think, and then the 4.9 from 2018 or 19. So those two bonds, theoretically, you could pay those off and avoid the interest. But we, like most municipalities and school districts, go through the bond bank, the Vermont Municipal Bond Bank. They're not set up to, they're not in the business to allow you to pay those off early because they use those proceeds to issue other loans. So they won't just accept it. They will entertain the idea of maybe doing it. But that would be a process to go back and forth. And um, I've already checked into it. And the soonest that we could uh, would be 2025 for one of the loans. The other one we couldn't do until 2028. Um, the other thing I would say is it doesn't really help as far as getting big money for projects. Because while we would avoid a pretty significant interest amount, that interest amount is spread out over the next 20 years. So the amount that we could actually garner would be just what was in the FY23 budget that you approved, which is one year's worth of interest. So I, I'm afraid what would happen is we would pay off a bond, not really have any big significant amount of money. And then if we do a major project at some time within the next few years, the only way to fund it would be to ask for another bond and right now, interest rates are not going down. No. So we'd be better off keeping the bonds we have and then trying to avoid a new bond, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah that was the point I was going to make, because I think we have bonds at interest rates that might be a thing of the past. It doesn't look very favorable for no. a while. Um, other questions? Yeah. Merrick. 
So I understand it might be unclear right now, but what is the what do you predict is the timeline for a track renovation? Uh, if if we had a design and a scope and all that sorted out, I mean, there's no reason to that we couldn't have have it out the bid for next summer. Um, yeah, if if we wanted it now, if it expands to turf and relocating uh, stands and baseball fields to accommodate eight lane tracks and things like that, then maybe it goes pushes off. And also, um, you know, who knows what the economy? Who knows? Who knows what costs are going to be next summer? But we anticipate you hold off a year to save them. But that that generally doesn't work. So spend it and be done with it. But you, if we had a design process and input and buy in. Uh, there's no there's no reason one of the other things that needs to be also is going to need to be put out on the table is it's going to take more than eight weeks to do so we're going to have to you know soccer season or track season or lacrosse season we're, we're going to have to do some give and take and utilize dog river and stuff like that so that all that stuff is that's again that's further down the road but that's some real consideration to folks folks understand and as a reality check, just not meaning to poo poo the idea, but just so you know, if if you go with artificial turf, you're probably doubling this estimate. I would think so. Yeah. It's a big investment if you're doing that. I'm not saying you should. I'm just saying yeah. it would then become a big challenge to be able to get the funding necessary to be able to do it next summer. So next summer is something that I think would be reasonable if things go well. Um, but if, if the scope increases a lot and we can't afford that project, then it may get delayed. Yeah. Um, Eva? Yeah, I just kind of wanted to say, say a couple of things more for like public record, um, <coughs> transparency of this process for me, but I, you know, we were going to have, the vote was on the agenda for last week and I asked for an extra week and you know, for me, I see my role as a board member as, um, you know, I think people voted for me because they hope that I will be representative of the values and the will of the community. And I didn't feel like I really understood that last week. And I feel like, you know, even though we have heard from some people and I see some familiar faces that have already spoken to us, um, we heard from a lot more people. And I think we, our process and, and my feeling on making a vote tonight, um, I feel a lot more secure in my um, understanding of what the will and the value of our community is around this particular topic. Um, <clears throat> I also do not see this as an either or. I don't wanna think about committing the funds tonight as saying, no, we aren't committing to net zero or no, we won't you know, do X, Y, Z projects at the middle school. Um, I think that this is an opportunity for the community to improve our um, processes around big spending decisions like this. Um, I think that our admin team does an amazing job and you all are super thoughtful and you have a lot of knowledge in your brains about what the process was from a perspective that I don't share and the community doesn't understand. So, um, so it's no question about how much thought any of you have put into it. It's more about transparency and public engagement around something like this, that there's a lot of decisions that come across this table um, for us to vote on, and they do not all require, you know, I don't feel a sense of requirement to engage the community about every little decision that we make. But something like this, where it's $2 million, really, if we're going to do it right, <laughs> eventually, um, 1.5 for tonight, um, you know, that's a big deal, and it's a big expense, and I want to feel secure that we have community support in that. And I and I do feel more secure tonight than I did last week. So I just wanna thank everybody for, for weighing in. Um, <clears throat> and then back to the commitment thing, another thing that makes me feel really confident making this decision tonight is exactly what Grant said, where it's like, we're in the commitment process, we're earmarking the funds, we're saying that we believe in this project, we're putting our support behind it, but if in the next, few months we stumble across something that tells us that this isn't going to work for one reason or another or we aren't going to be able to come up with the remaining funds to, to do the project right the first time then we have the ability as a community to decide on something different um so 
yeah. <laughs> I, I think we can always look inward and improve our, our process. So I do think there's room for improvement um, uh, from a board perspective. And the, the idea that Mia and both Kristen, I'll just echo that about the facilities committee is a new committee, but we do have the opportunity to be more helpful um, in sort of prioritizing and engaging community, that sort of thing, when stuff like this comes up. Joe. Sure. I try not to talk too much at board meetings because all our, our, our time is precious and a lot of times folks say things I might already be thinking. Um, I've put a lot of thought and research into this vote tonight. Um, it did take me a little off guard last week, but I am feeling much more prepared. So even though I was tired last week and wasn't sure where I was going to fall, I appreciate that time. Um, I've done some research into what tracks at U32 and St. John's Break cost, what turf fields cost. I've talked to um, coaches and athletic director. Um, I, I feel like I'm gonna equivocate a little bit because I also feel an incredible amount of weight that the board has heard over the last couple of years about what our community has gone through. And I don't know that we've all fully really processed that nor maybe we ever really will. We are losing some really fantastic teachers um, and staff. We helped clean because there, we couldn't keep custodians because it's an almost impossible task to keep this place running. Um, we have people who are really struggling. Our students have talked to their, our student board members have talked to students about the really dire needs that our students have about how they're going to go into the world after what they've experienced at their high school. So I, I do not take this vote lightly. I, I think as a, um, I'm not trying to be the skunk at the garden party, quite the opposite. I feel a lot more um, secure in supporting an improvement to a physical facility, knowing the incredible depth that we saw at the recent meeting from Libby and her team about what we've invested in student supports, staff supports, and hiring more staff with some really important critical behavior um, expertise and trying to really beef up that. I think if we had if we had not seen that level of commitment and investment into the experience of our staff and our kids, I would feel really out of touch um, doing something about an external physical activity outside. So I really appreciate the work that you guys did in that and that we are, I think we've also seen over the last few months that we're using these federal dollars really wisely. Um, you know, I also, as, as a parent on the parents group whose eighth grader is graduating and is gonna be coming here to school, you know, we're trying to figure out how to celebrate the end of the year, which is coming out of a really strange year. And, and trying to scrape together what we can to put together some sort of a fun celebration. So there's a lot of competing priorities, I guess, big and little. Um, and Libby, what you said tonight was incredibly helpful about the diligence and making sure we're using the right money for the right things so that we're really taking advantage of where we're at as a community with these federal dollars. Um, that also brings me some peace of mind that it's okay to go ahead and, and, um, and support something like um, investing in the track. So on the one hand, while I say that this is an incredibly important vote and that every dollar that we spend as a board, we are also representing people who are not here tonight, who may not have voted for us, who may not have students in the school. Again, and I'm sorry, I know I'm going on, I'm almost done. <laughs> um, I think we really have done our due diligence and I have, I have um, you know, come around to appreciating and feeling okay making this level of, of a decision tonight. Um, I do think I would really like uh, if there's a committee or an RFP or something um, based on what we did hear from athletic director and from coaches and from students for other sports and how we could extend the fall and spring sports season. It would be great to just ask the question of how much the turf would cost while we've already dug up the, the field. So I'm happy to hear that that's like a possible add on um, because I really would like us to consider hey, if we're going to be digging up the dirt and, and making a 20, 30 year investment over there, let's just ask the question, knowing that it might, we might not like the answer. Um, so I thank everyone for indulging me in this. I really, um, I really want folks to understand that and, and folks who may be watching and, and wondering um, and who maybe haven't followed the board meeting that there is a lot of really important investment in our MRPS community and it's nice to be able to make a vote like this, but also that we have we have done a really good job of managing limiting resources during a really challenging time. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Jill. Very well said. Um, 
Other, yeah. Yeah, I just I just wanted to chime in a little bit of, with the gratitude that we took the week to think about it and hear more from the community, and of course gratitude to everybody who showed up tonight, um, because I too have been thinking about this a lot over the past week and. Um, certainly the majority of the comments that we have received are in favor of updating the track. Um, and that's with good reason. Um, we're, you know, the, everyone who has written to us and spoken tonight has spoken so eloquently on that. I'm obviously not going to just reiterate what's been said, that, but I just wanted to share that it all resonates very much with me as well. Um, I, like Charlie and George, also get a little emotional because I, too, am an old trackster and it it sure is, you know, everything that people have said, it, it sure is a way of finding one's identity. Um, I also want to note how wonderful it is in the so many of the comments that we got to hear people using these reasons of inclusivity and accessibility and the and the equanimity of, of track and field. And I, it makes me feel really good that that is something that is part of this conversation because it is so important. Um, and as a board, we are really, you know, ever since um, passing the uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion policy, we still are sort of like stumbling mm -hmm. through and finding our way and how to incorporate that into our decision making. So it's very helpful to hear people use that as reasons. Um, it also know we, we also know that making decisions through an equity lens sometimes means prioritizing things, making a hard decision, prioritizing things, even when the, the majority of the public isn't necessarily in favor of that. And that is one of the things that you know I took the time to wrestle with as a as a board member and somebody making a, a pretty big decision like that. But the comments from our our community are really valuable, and that was and it was very helpful to hear. Um, from you, Libby, and Andrew and Grant, the different, you know, to put where this falls into that puzzle piece, because I, or the, what puzzle piece this is, because I think that's a way of us figuring out what could we be letting go of? What, you know, what could the, the downsides be of this? And where I land is that at least in this moment, with this golden opportunity that we have of, significant amount of federal money coming our way, there really aren't very many downsides to spending even a significant amount of money like this on an improvement like this. Um, so I just wanted to share that and, um, and offer that throughout this process, or not through this process, but I, I think, um, echo what Emma said, that I think there is all often room for improvement on how we hold processes for big decisions and small decisions, and want to just offer another thought that maybe we could spend some retreat time kind of examining how this process went for us and maybe to figure out ways we could, could improve it from the board perspective. I think Amanda has something. Amanda? Yeah, I just, again, I grant you don't know how much I appreciate your expertise and all just your work. Um, I'm always very, in, you know, just away with all your knowledge. Uh, I would love to have part of your brain to be like, okay. Um, okay. So I appreciate you. I appreciate Libby and Andrew and all the work that was done. I'm also here channeling Lorena. If you guys know who Lorena is, she's in my picture. She's an amazing indigenous runner. Um, and I put a lot of thought I had, um, for me was, and just to be transparent, being able to decide this in a week was really hard because it was a surprise for me last Wednesday that I had to vote on this and then only given a week to be able to do my due diligence when I had just a lot of personal things happening that, um, I would have devoted some more time, you know, like standing outside and asking people outside of the school, but I just didn't have the time this week. I did send emails and um, put it on Facebook and from Porch Forum to be able to get the feedback. And I even then I know that I call a lot of people that still didn't know about this vote and about this money. So for me, that was really hard. Um, and today the report that Andrew did, um, did shine light a lot of the questions that people had. Um, but I think there is still a, a, a major part of the of our school community that didn't know that this vote was happening. So I um, I come here very humble, 
with uh, just experiencing all the knowledge and all the voices that were here. I really, for me, is really important to hear from the community, the emails. I appreciate everybody that shone light about the importance of running. And, you know, my daughter just ran, John, the, the girls on the run and ran her first mile on Tuesday. Uh, and, and so I'm really proud. And, and everybody knows that for me, equity is a really big part of looking at the big picture and asking the questions. And I really hope that in our retreat, we, we start to think about the equity tool that the board created and just looking at policy and you know, how this affects and that we move our board and our district in that direction to really look at the big picture for all of our students that impact. Um, and you know, we, we had the turf conversation that for me is really important because it kind of creates that baseline for all the other sports too. Um, I want to suggest and um, to also, I, I thought a lot about net zero. You know, I have come a long way in understanding the environmental. I'm not there yet. I don't understand uh, much of it. This is why we have experts that can teach us about these things. I would like to propose that in line of that 1.5 million and just channeling students that came to us last summer too, that we put aside at least $50,000 to do the feasibility study so that we don't have to go in circles for the future as part of that conversation too. Um, and, and so that we can move forward in thinking long-term. I do wanna have our kids to have future. So this is all great, thanks. I have the clarification of what Amanda was just proposing. <clears throat> were you, Amanda, were you saying draw 50,000 from the one and a half million or are you saying, yes. in a, are, are you offering an amendment to the motion then? Yes. Okay. But Do I have is, to say it? Is it? Change me the place. Uh, <laughs> I make a motion to amend, no, I made an, what is it? Do I, to amend the original motion, who made that motion? Was it Emma? Or, uh, Rhett made the motion. Correct. Um, to uh, set wow. aside the 1.5 million, 50,000 for a feasibility study. I did ask a few people. I think. Oh, so sorry. I think, I think Rhett needs to amend his own motion. And also, I think there's a question of asking whether there's 50,000 elsewhere for that study. Right. Um, Jill, our parliamentarian, what are we doing? <laughs> I think Rhett has to amend his own motion. Okay. And I, and I would like to ask if there's $50,000 elsewhere for that. So the math that I'd given to Libby added to 1.6 million right. Right. as opposed to the 1.5. So I think the, um, I'm not sure if the language was, was what the language was, but it, it needs to be that we're committing 1.5 like the warning said, or, or the um, agenda said. Right. I would say if you can keep that warning or that um, motion at 1.5 for the track, you could entertain another motion right, to right. also commit 50,000 toward a feasibility study. Um, or, you know, the other thing is there's a list of set asides in the quarterly report that you get. I could just simply add that as right. we're going to set that aside. So it's, it's nothing you would have to actually vote on. It would just be incorporated with that list of other set-asides that, that we already know about. So either way is fine, but I don't I don't think we need to take away from the 1.5 because we've got more than that available. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. We also don't know what, we still don't know what we're trying to define yet. So yeah. I think it'd be good to kind of, let's define that, then yeah. we have a sense of what we really need for that. And okay. Do a little research on that. Sounded like Amanda wanted to, yeah. Yeah. I just I talked to a few people and to st from the net zero world in the city, and they say around thirty to seventy thousand is the ballpark for what uh, the study will cost. Um, okay. And then so that that is what I got thirty to seventy. So I just kind of put at fifty. Fifty was the number of one person, but thirty to seventy was the other. And and so um, so so that's that's what I have. I just also. When doing research about to make my decision today, I was kind of going back to just like public comments and got into the net zero presentation by the students where we actually committed to write a policy 
um, on this same thing that we okay. just never got to the policy committee. So I plan to bring it back because we did decide that in that meeting um, and made a mo motion that the policy committee will look at a policy um, around this issue. So. Yep. Well, I, th I think we definitely need to have a net zero conversation among the board and, and then figure that out. And so like there's resources to do that. Um, so, okay. so Amanda, are you good with not amending then this motion? Yeah. Yes. Thanks for asking me. Okay. Um, um, it was also just so incredibly moving to hear from you know, through the age spectrum, you know, we had students, we have people that are here doing like a retrospective of what your experience meant in being part of such a, a high impact community that it was really formative is really what I heard for folks. Um, and so as, as a board member that does represent the community of Roxbury, um, I do want to think about the work that the board can do um, in time upcoming around ensuring that Roxbury students can access. Um, you know, the track program got me thinking about all the incredible, um, you know, after school enrichment opportunities that there are to, um, to our students. And so I'm thinking a lot about, you know, how can our Roxbury, um, you know, how can our Roxbury students access these activities? So I know that, you know, I've talked with Jim a little bit that we do need to do some work around a transportation policy um, that, you know, when the merger, and I've been looking at uh, the, the original merger's um, report, which is great reading for those of you who have not read it yet. It's really pretty foundational. Um, and so in the merger uh, report, it was said that the board would take the time to look at a transportation policy that would enable Roxbury students to reasonably um, access after school um, programs. So I think that's a step that we need to take um, to ensure that our Roxbury students can also access the incredible experiences that you all um, are talking about. Um, Roxbury is an incredible little community and we're also really little and we don't have a lot of access to a lot of facilities. And I would love to see our students um, be able to have the experiences that you all are naming. Thank you. Yeah. I would like to suggest we have a vote and let these very patient people go home. Um, any further discussion? We call it a question. Yes. It's like the first time I've ever used that number. Uh, all those in favor, rest proposal to allocate 1.5 million for tracks. We need to commit. That's what to commit. Agenda. Thank you for being correct. To commit 1.5 million. Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. Thank you. And if you want to wait around for a C14 reading, it's brilliant <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and and uh, thank you, everyone. This it, it was wonderful to hear everyone's stories and uh, see the community come out like this. It's uh, it's it's truly moving. We appreciate all the hard work. Very nice. Very nice. Um, uh, so our fourth reading of C14, um, any questions or comments on that? that we made some small language changes. I can highlight that we fixed the footnotes yep. and the formatting and that we removed the actual names of the people who are 504 coordinators for each building because there's just so much fluctuation in who that person is. So we just said that it's typically the guidance counselor and the principal of each building and that the that, that those names and contact numbers will be, um, contact information will be readily available on our website, which hopefully we can just like make that happen. And that way that can be like a living document that gets changed if we get a new principal or guidance counselor. Yep. Um, when it happens. Well, so, uh, and was there any, what else did we change? Was I think that, that was it. That was it. It yeah. was pretty minor, like just sort of formatting stuff mostly. Amanda, anything, anything that we missed in terms of the changes? No. Uh, I think that's it. Um, any questions um, about that? One other thing uh, is that we st are stumbling across new information all the time at the policy committee. It's very exciting, this committee. <laughs> um, but one of the things that we've we realized is that you actually, according to 
state law, I'm guessing. Statute, yeah. <laughs> um, we need to have, we have the three readings, but we need to have a, a hearing, a policy hearing for each policy that we actually adopt in addition to the three readings. Oh my. Yeah. So, um, so we're, uh, Anna is going to put it on a future agenda and they have to warn that separately. And that's when we actually adopt the policy. So the adoption during a regular board yeah. meeting, right. it's not an oh, a board meeting. Yeah, not a policy yeah. committee meeting. A board no, meeting. It's not right. Okay. meeting. Right, okay. meeting. Right, but it's just called okay. a hearing. It's not one of the three readings. And then it's it's sort of warned more yeah, we've just clearly. Been, we've just been warning it inaccurately. Okay. Yeah. Well, Anna, thanks for getting on top of that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, thanks, Anna. Keeping Does us that straight. Mean that we have a bunch of improperly enacted policies. Mm. Maybe. But they Maybe were not. warned, but they yeah. just weren't. Yeah, they weren't they were blasted by fireworks. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah. it's happening. May I? Ask, I don't know if I asked this last week, but are all the policies that need to be considered on the website? Yep. To, uh, there are no any additional policies. There aren't any. We don't have any there isn't a bucket of sort of unfinished policies, policies or anything like that. Or, I don't know. No, I mean all the all the unfinished policies will come to you as part of these for. But yeah, so, new consideration. I will say, Rhett, that the we get uh, the majority of our policies come to us from the Vermont School Boards Association, the VSBA. So I should look there too. So if you and look there, 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 yeah, like just because I just want to. So they have a model that. policy manual that's actually very well organized okay, and labeled and categorized and numbered and structured, which we're going to be moving towards that. We're going to be moving towards that organization for our own policies, just so that they align with the VSBA. So that if people see a policy on the VSBA that they're hoping that Montpelier has, and then they come to us, it's not with a different number like C14 when it should be A A12. So we're going to be aligning more with the VSBA policy page. So you could always that, look there as like their recommended policies. And I just, I just spend Emma and I spend a chunk of time separately uh, putting all an Excel document that eventually you know you can look at it which has like the mirror of here's the recommended policies from the VSBA the ones that we have you know the ones that we should have that want to have so that maybe some of you want to look at it and we'll say hey we should have that policy that you know we can we can take that so that's um that's a fun little excel exercise I've been doing and Emma has also been uh playing with at different times. So yeah, so that's great. And and that we do have a few other policies from community members that might come up. Yeah, yeah no, new policies come up too, just from new requirements of law and things of that nature. So we're not voting on this policy tonight? No. No. Because we need to have a hearing. Yeah, okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Any yeah, and we also had there was something defaulty or faulty with our third reading, wasn't there? Didn't we post the wrong thing? It was the, right. That's yeah. why we had a fourth. There was yeah. just formatting issues with that. Yeah. yeah. That was good. That next time we'll vote. All right. Any other any further questions or comments on the C14 policy? Motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Hi. Hi. Great. Thanks. Really great work, everyone. So. Thanks, everybody.